Welcome to Commander Central episode 49, and today we're going to be having a bit of a deck tech extravaganza. Woo! Um, it's like speed dating, but hopefully this one doesn't end with a restraining order. Mm. Um, <laughs> before that, we'll talk about some games we played, maybe some news, and anything else our parole officers allow. I am Dana. Legal obligation <laughs> says my name is Max. <laughs> and I'm Chris. Or so you tell us. Um so anything else we want to touch on before we get into the extravaganza here? I think yes, we can there we, is one thing. Well, what's your one thing? Max, I think your roommate's burning something upstairs right now. I think something is possibly on fire. <laughs> 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 well, but you know, no no one's screaming yet, so we'll just assume that's all going well. I can smell it. I and can I'm just too. like <laughs> uh oh, I'm waiting for the, the cheerleaders to come on. <laughs> I know I know we he dropped some mac and cheese in the burner the other night, so that's that that's might be very what well is. what right. it could it's be. It's not as bad as the phone call I got from my wife. I think it was about a year ago and she's like, Oh yeah, when you come home, just don't be surprised there's a whole bunch of flour in the oven and I'm like, Why? She's like, I started something on fire in there and it was the only way I could think of to put at it least, out. <laughs> that's the, actually the at least she thought of the using flour or right? something. Right. Do you have an electric oven? I think it is. So turn the oven off and close the door. There's no oxygen. It'll die. Unless it was a big enough fire to wear. <laughs> right. I have no clue. There was a lot of flour in there, and it took a long time to clean up. <laughs> um, I have one thing I'm going to briefly to touch on here that I've been thinking about a little bit. Um, so a week or two ago, um, DJ Johnson on Brainstorm Brewery was going off on Mana Crypt. It was right before the ban list came down, and there was, of course, no bans. Um and he wanted Mana Crypt to be banned. In EDH. He, in EDH. And he okay. went on a tangent about it. And to the point where like he's you know, he said he's like, I've got like four grand in Mana Crypt sitting at my in my shop and I'm gonna lose my butt if it gets banned, but I don't care. I think it should be gone. So I, I don't really think about that very much, except for this happened like roughly the same time as we came back from Vegas, where we saw a lot more mana crypts than we usually see in our meta as well. Um, and not that people don't run like expensive cards in our meta, they just don't run mana crypt for some reason. Uh, probably because we'd like their games to go 10, 12, 14, 16 turns most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, however, having seen so many of them in Vegas and seeing like what a huge difference it makes on decks, I really do understand the temptation to put them in your decks if you can afford them. You have. And I have. But like, I want to I want to hear people's opinions on that, though, because unlike Soul Ring, which... Everyone, everyone has. And if you don't have a soul ring for a new deck you built because you don't have a pre-con, like, I bet if you walk into your local game store on EDH night and say, does anyone have a soul ring they can give me? People will give you soul rings. I mean, it's, it's like a 2 or $3 card, but everyone has soul rings. Mana Crypt is not the same thing. Right, no. It's, it's a $100 card. It was only available in either that book set years and years ago as a judge promo or as the Kaladesh um, invention. And Eternal Masters. Yeah, that's right. Your Soul Masters and then had to reprint as well. Mm-hmm. But all of those are over a hundred dollars. I think they, they had crept down to like seventy, but it's back up. It's between eighty and a hundred. I think the EMA one is like in the ninety range. But so, yeah, you're right. It's a so hundred bucks. Unlike with Soul Ring, where everyone has a chance to get that turn run Soul Ring, a, a very narrow percentage of the player base can actually afford to throw those mana crypts in their deck. Right. Um, so first of all, I'm gonna ask you two: Do you think it's bannable for that reason? Because not everyone can run it, and it's so strong. I'm going to approach this from a competitive player standpoint, Mm -hmm. especially seeing how I play Modern, and everyone knows how expensive Modern is. Now, in Modern, I have no problem dropping $80 a piece for Noble Hierarchs, okay? Because of the simple fact of that format is supported to the point where I can win money back. For sure. Right, and you have in the past. Yes, without Commander isn't supported that way, and we all saw... Sorry to whoever did this, and you can hate me for it, but the debacle that happened with the Commander Pod tournament in Vegas. Right. Yep. You know, they tried to do something cool for it, but it just didn't work out. Sure. So without it being supported, I think that it could be ban-worthy because the game's getting to the point, and I actually saw a thing on Twitter, I think it was last week, about people talking about uh, common cards are all going to be two bucks. Yeah. The way the prices are going up, and people are going to not be able to play anymore. Yes. Yeah. So cards like that, I have no problem getting banned. Because like if, if you're an average pod of four people, everyone has the same chance to draw that soul ring. And yep. you're going to get weird things where like that one dude gets it three games in a row and you don't haven't seen yours in three weeks. Like That's going to happen sometimes because it just does. It happens a lot. Right. <laughs> but you also get the situation when, when you have essentially two soul rings when Mana Crypt is in your deck and everyone else doesn't. Yep. That's twice the chance you have that in your opening hand. And 
it, the other people are just never ever going to have that opportunity because they don't have one in their deck. And it puts you if your if your commander is like a four drop that's too colorless, that's so huge drawing that crypt in turn one or turn two, and you can just play your commander then on on turn two instead of turn four. I mean, it's a that's just, that's just massive. And the life gain is easy to mitigate. Um, I don't know. I I I'm as someone who went and picked up another one. I had one. I picked up a second one after GP Vegas and put it in a deck. I'm kind of feeling like I wouldn't mind if they get rid of it either. I'm going to be the naysayer at okay. this table. I think it it's not a problem. I think the people who can afford that type of card and can use it properly, big big emphasis on properly, like I'm just going to slot it into my, my one EDH deck that doesn't have a lot of stuff with a lot of colorless symbols in it. Okay. You're not using that card properly. You're wasting the mana, you know, whatever. But if you are a player who can afford a card like that, who can justify running it, I see no problem with people playing it. This is what we've discussed with reserve list cards and stuff like that. There comes a point where maybe you're not outpricing your meta, but if you're running that over Mana Crypt, or Mana, yeah, Mana Crypt, right, is the other one? Vault. No, Mana Vault. Mana Vault. If you're running Crypt over Vault, there's an obvious reason, whether it's because you need that zero drop or because you need it to untap every turn and you'll risk taking the damage. Right. I mean, I'll be honest. I am considering putting in two of my decks. The first being Brago, just because it's more Brago shenanigans. Right. The second being Dramoka. So a few months ago, I tested Mana Vault in Dramoka. I played with it for pretty much right up until GP Vegas is when I made the switch. because And I found out that playing Mana Vault... Using it on turn one to get Dramoke out on turn two is great. But now I have to waste my next four turns trying to untap it because you have to pay the four mana to untap it during your upkeep. Right. It's not like Grimonolith where you can do it whenever. Um, where if I put Mana Crypt in there, I'll take that damage uh, every yes. turn that, if it means I get Dramoke out on turn two. It's perfect for that deck, um, really. So those are the two decks if I had one. I'm not saying, like, I don't have one right now. Am I in the position to buy one? Yeah, maybe in a couple weeks if I budget correctly. I could go to Phil at our local game shop and buy one if he has one, or I could order one from flipsidegaming.com and get one, or I could order one from Card Kingdom. Just make sure you use promo code CMDR to get 10% off your purchase. From Flipside Gaming, from Flipside not, Gaming. not right, Card right, Kingdom. Right. Um, I, would, I would definitely pick one up. It's a, we play in a singleton format. We're not playing four ofs. We have yeah, that's one fair. copy in 99 cards in a format where there's no partial Paris Mulligan in our meta. I know some people still probably do it at kitchen table, but like I'm not being, I can't sculpt my hand to make sure I start out with that nut hand to get sure. my 15 mana by turn four with the right amount of cards in Dramoka. Like in my opinion, it is a fair card in EDH. If you have the ability to purchase one, you use it responsibly. Yeah. Do it. I, the only thing that I feel that's different about it is, like, if I put a Tundra in a deck, Tundra is obviously a really good card in an Azorius deck, but I never feel like, I feel like it's better than what the person next to me is running, for sure. It's better than that Guildgate they're running. Absolutely. Or that basic island but or basic the, But the amount of games where that Tundra is, wins the game, whereas having a guild gate would have lost me the game, versus the amount of times that Mana Crypt wins me a game, I think there's a pretty steep difference there. I think there's a difference. I don't think it's steep. And maybe, and, well, and, and, maybe and, in comparison, because you're comparing a land to a Mana Rock right. that costs the same as that land zero and untaps every turn with the maybe the incidental chance of you taking three damage. Yeah, I guess when you compare it like that, it is steep. But when you're comparing two different lands, like a Tundra to a Guildgate or, you know, Prairie Stream or even the Cycle Land. Compared, Irrigated Farmland. Thank you. I was getting there. Um, compared to, like, Mana Vault and Mana Crypt, there's not much difference between those two except for the fact that one you have to pay to untap and one you might get hurt because it untapped. Well, Mana Vault is not cheap. But Mana Vault's over 20 it's now, I almost think. almost 30. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, it's getting there. It's, yeah. a, it's like 25. You have like four and, of them, don't you? And, <laughs> but realistically, honestly, that may be underpriced. Mm -hmm. Like if, 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 if in six weeks from now we're having this conversation someone's like, Man of Vault's up to 50, I'd be like, yeah, that, I, I can see that. I saw that coming. Yeah. 
Um, so I, I'm sorry. I disagree with both of you. I think okay, that's, there is that's no reason for that card to be banned. I think there are bigger problems in the game. Cyclonic Rift. Cyclonic Rift. I'm actually going to pl- say Soul Ring. Yeah, yeah, a Rift I get. I, I get why people say Soul Ring should be banned. And it's the, the complete opposite of what you guys were saying about... Because everyone has Soul Because everybody has it. Sure. Everybody can put a Soul Ring into any deck. And I deck. believe that's why it shouldn't be banned. Well, also, the other card DJ was railing on a Cyclonic Rift. <laughs> he really didn't like that one either. Well, so. I, I'm on board for that being banned, too. I understand why it's not. I understand why it did not get banned I, in I'm the last I'm kind game. of coming around in the banned Rift train here myself as well. So. I, I'm... I would vote either way. Like, I'm not going to be upset if it get ba- for if sure. it gets banned when Ravnica comes out. I'm also not going to be upset that it's not banned. I think the comment I made about about Rift was, if I was in the rules committee, I'm not sure I could vote to ban it. And if they and if they banned it, I'd be perfectly cool with it. I'd be like, oh, yeah. all right, great, that's awesome. But I don't know if I could justify it either. It, so it falls into that auto include category, but the, mm-hmm. I think there are also a lot worse cards that fall into that auto it's, include. It's category. now the number one most played blue blue card in EDH rec, past counterspell. I'm surprised it took this long. I kind of am too. Well, actually, let me rephrase that. I understand why it took that long because up until Modern Master 17, it had only one other reprint, yeah. and that was in Commander 14. But like that could be in every modern masters reprint set, and it's still going to be an eight or ten dollar card. And when it got reprinted, it did drop to five dollars, and now it's back over ten. Yeah, I mean, we say this with all these supplemental set shows we do. Like, oh look, Austria Command is now two dollars. It took what a month and a half for uh, that version of Austria Command from Iconic Masters to go back up above ten. Is it back over ten again? Well, I'm just guessing, but I'm thinking it it's, wouldn't surprise it's not me. two anymore. Right? No, because I mean we. I pre-ordered the Austria Command version of it for like two fifty on Card Kingdom yeah. and bought a playset because at two fifty, why wouldn't you do that? Right, for sure. But we are not a financial podcast. So we are not. We're not. We, are not. we should move on to the rest of the show. Um, if you want to get back to us and throw us your opinions on Mana Crypt and or Cyclonic Rift, you can find us online at multiple places. Chris, tell them where they can find us. Online. <laughs> what is no. online, Chris? <laughs> tell us about the internet, Chris. The old Boobies. interwebs. Back in my day. <laughs> you had to put your AOL disc in the CD drive. You like had to get your sister <laughs> off the phone. This is like the second week in a row we'd reference AOL. <laughs> Jeez. I miss my aim. Our new uh, sponsor, AOL. Does AOL even exist? I don't think they do. Yahoo owns them, which means Verizon owns them. Because I know Hotmail doesn't exist. I found that out when I had to try to unlock my Wizards account because it was through a Hotmail email that no longer exists. I will tell you this, truth, like a little digression here. This is absolutely a true story. When I was in college, I, I had a Hotmail account. And in, in the middle of a computer lab, I typed in Hotmail to go to my Hotmail address. I typed in Hot M-A-L-E. And it's not. <laughs> it is not a web. At least at the time. It not. was not. Absolutely not a safe for college site, but they didn't have any blocking software at the time. So it, it probably came wasn't up, invented. The whole deal, yeah, the whole thing came up right there, flashing for everyone in the computer lab to see. I'm quick, furiously <laughs> trying to get the window closed. <laughs> we support that, Dan. Right, right, right. <laughs> oh no! So I have a confession. We no, that's <laughs> we do that at work every now and then. Someone will be like, "You should Google this." No, if you're asking me to Google something, that means you don't want to do it on your computer. Right, so you Google right, right, it. exactly. So. For everybody, when you are online <laughs> looking us up, it is C M D R Central C E N T R A L dot com. Yeah. <laughs> How about the Twitter birds? Where are we at there? Twitter birds. Uh, you can search us at C M D R Central. Facebook search us C M D R Central, and find us on the YouTubers at C M D R Central. And you can find us at C M D Central at AOL dot com. No, you can't actually. <laughs> yeah, I want to type in a- we AOL should and see, see, what, see what happens, see what happens there. <laughs> You can also find us on Patreon by searching CMDR Central. And as we announced last week, uh, we announced our new tiers, our new levels, including that brand new Commander Central play mat that if you are so kind to pledge and support us at that $30 level, uh, you'll get one sent to you after a couple months, which, you know, we should probably order those soon. <laughs> yeah, we, should, we absolutely should. Um, we also have a couple new supporters on Patreon. We do have a couple new supporters, and I apologize. I did not announce them last week. Um the first one being Cam Moat, so thank you, Cam. And the second being Dan Krause. Um, and I say it that way because Dan and I had the pleasure of meeting Dan in GP Vegas. He's a really great guy. 
Uh, he's like just a diehard Magic fan. He supports a lot of a lot of podcasts out in the area and a lot of content creators. And we're just happy he's on our on our ship now. And so welcome Dan and welcome Cam as well and everybody else who has supported us in the past and future. We appreciate it, and you help keep the lights on and help get us to the point where we can do cool play mats and. Maybe in a few months we'll have a nice, cool new swag to add to the repertoire of Commander Central merchandise. For I sure. need a hat. Uh, one likes so you don't have to wear your pin. You can just have a Commander Central hat. That's not actually not a bad idea. I'll wear my pin with my hat anyways. Fish hook optional. Oh, fish hook's got to go <laughs> on there. <laughs> I should uh, go find no, him again. let's not do fedoras. <laughs> I don't know if I can get past that. Do-rags? Commander Central do-rags? <laughs> that, would be, that would be pretty tight. No. <laughs> My wife would not be no. a fan of me coming in and rocking it, this. If, if we do the do-rags and you gotta get the mustache with the yeah, handlebars. Yeah, that's just, that's just too much. <laughs> and then you'll be sleeping on my couch for a couple right, nights. Exactly. What are those things that the old school, like Fred from Scooby-Doo wore around his neck? Like as the, the ascot. The ascot. <laughs> ascot. <laughs> not as guard, <laughs> like Thor. We you where Thor is from, yeah. Oh, Thor <laughs> in an ascot. That'd be nice. <laughs> be formal. I formal am Thor. fancy. Look at my hacks. <laughs> Die. <laughs> All right. I think we have officially scared away anyone who would ever possibly want to sponsor us after all that. Marvel, um, we're looking at you. Come help us. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, so we have a... Um, plethora? A plethora, an extravaganza of mini deck techs to do here today. Um, Fast and Furious style. So who should we start with, gentlemen? Should we, should we start with how people can get these mini deck techs? We should. Speaking of Patreon, so... Uh, this used to be our five dollar re- Patreon level in the past. Effect of the first of August, this is now our ten dollar level. So, uh, you support us with ten dollars a month for a couple months. We'll get, we'll we'll contact you, ask you for your deck list, and we'll do a quick little uh ten to fifteen minute deck rundown yeah. for you. Typically, the idea behind this was we do this before our main topic of a show. Yes, and we just kind of got. Uh, so many of them. So many of them all at once. And we kind of realized like, oh, we have like six and four or six in the queue. And the way the future schedule was kind of rolling out, it the topics where we would normally do these in were shows like uh, set reviews for right. Modern Ma- for uh, Corset 19 or the set review for Commander 18 coming up. Uh, so we decided to take the the four that was kind of sitting there waiting and do and, one show and do one show for we had, all four guys we had talked about doing a bonus show for just these but then another bonus show opportunity opportunity has appeared so we will maybe touch on that later yeah all right number one chris is like what bonus show what's going bonus on show. We, all don't, right. we don't tell chris anything <laughs> right right <laughs> I'm just the talent. He's not you are the talent. Because he's not on Slack. Because you know, you, you <laughs> I'm not on Slack. <laughs> <laughs> you, you and Matt Morgan are the talent. Oh, You know, saying all this Slack stuff, I'm going to go in one day and I'm just going to have personal messages from everybody. Right, and be, be like, what's going on? Things, I'm going right. to be like, now nah, I got to turn off those notifications. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you haven't been getting them? I've been telling everybody every day. Just PM Just PM, <laughs> PM Chris and he'll just. I don't have any. I look today. Yeah. He'll get back to you eventually. First up. Rafael Garcia. Uh, you can find Rafael on the Twitter birds at R A G A R C I 2. And you can find him on Tapped Out, which is where all his deck lists are. And he's got several of them. And it's the same name R A G A R C I 2. R A Garcia 2. Um, so um, the deck, he, he, he gave us a few decks to pick. In fact, but he told us to pick. Pick one, whatever one you wanted. But the choice was really fairly easy. Because <laughs> um, he's got a deck called Shirtless Bear Fighter. And Dana just saw Shirtless and was like, yeah, I'm in. I am in. It's <laughs> oh, like, I thought it's we like, were doing Kemba. It's like Hotmail.com. <laughs> and <I> just, <laughs> Oh, so speaking of Hotmail, I did look and AOL is still, it's a, still up and functional. Still okay. a valid website. Is it well, twenty four ninety nine a month? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I knew about Raphael liking bears actually ahead of this. Yeah. And he won the Rat Colony deck that we gave away last month. So I actually, in a collection I picked up, there was a Golden Bear from Portal and a Bear Cub from... Portal 2. Portal 2. And I put them, I threw them both in. Now, like, as part of the deck, I just threw them in the box. Nice. Because I'm like, yeah, those are bears he may not have. So now he probably and has they are totally in the list. Yes. <laughs> right, yes. They are bears. Maybe so. because of you. Right. Um, yeah, it could be. Um, so let's look at uh, Bear Fighter deck. Sure, it was Bear Fighter deck. The commander is... The shirtless bear fighter, Surak Dragonclaw. 
Kudos. Although he is not shirtless in this picture. He's wearing bear, though. He, has he is pelt. definitely wearing a bear pelt. So kudos, because I tried a Serac Dragon Call Claw deck about a year ago. You didn't have enough bears in your deck, I think, I, is the problem. I, I went with the generic beast over right, bear. Over bear, and that was where things um, went wrong. It, it must have been. Not the fact that, you know, getting Protean Hulk stolen out of every <laughs> time when I played the deck. Uh did something. I'll try Protein Hawk. What can possibly go wrong? All the <laughs> things. All the things can go wrong. And I'm assuming that's why there is no Protein Hulk in this list. Oh, it's also not a bear. It's not a bear. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, and that's why you took the deck apart. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So let's look at his uh, land base here briefly. 38 lands, which for a three-color deck seems fair. And this is obviously a relatively casual deck, too. Like, when you're playing, you know, bear art tribal, you're not going whole hog here this is this is a fun deck clearly um 38 seems like a legit amount of money oh excuse me that yeah. 38 seems like a legit amount of lands to run in a three color deck I'm, I'm on board with that um the the division on them it, he's got um 14 forests three islands and three mountains um half his mana symbols in the deck are green so he's gonna be casting green a lot more than other things I still think that might be skewed a little bit too much towards forests. More than half of his symbols. Yeah, more than are half green. are green. It's like almost seventy-five percent of his symbols are green, and he's only running about forty forest green generating manas. I, I think there's going to be enough times when he struggles to maybe get that blue symbol or that red symbol for Sirach, just because there's not that many. Like the the land base is pretty is pretty basic in here. I mean, he's running like uh, Swiftwater Cliffs, which is the ETB tap to gain a life land. Again, because this is a ca- very casual deck. Yeah. Um, so I might tweak that slightly and maybe drop down to 11 for us or 12, no, probably 12 for us and put one more of each other basic in it, maybe. I think generically, just knowing this is a casual deck. Probably gets away with it, though, too. Like, you're he, not going to get punished for it. He gets away with it, but I also think adding City of Brass or Mana Confluence isn't going to make this a competitive deck. Sure. It just might it even out easier. his draws and his casting ability. It'll make life easier. Yes. Well, you could also cut a couple of the forests and add in a few more of the other tap lands. Like, he's only yeah. got a few of them in here. You could add the other cycle of them in there, too. Sure. And, I mean, if you want to keep the casual feeling alive, you could put the shock lands in here and just don't shock yourself. Right. Bring them in tapped. I don't know why you would no, do you that. Al- you always shock yourself. That's how you make it casual, because you're just like, I'll just take two and do nothing with it. <laughs> I will it. take the Chris, pain. you're at three. <laughs> <laughs> well, or Exotic Orchard in a three-color deck is almost always going to be good, and it's it's nothing. It costs, you know, 50 cents or something, so that's an easy one to yep. slot in there as well. Um, so, yeah. No, I mean, the land base is what it is. I, I think you can maybe tweak it a little bit, but for this deck, I understand everything in there that makes sense. Um, so we'll do Creatures the Last, because, you know... They're all bears. They're all bears. Um, anything in the instant list that jumps out at you guys? Uh, Awaken the bear, clearly in there because it says bear, um, which is a giant growth effect. There's a giant growth, which has bear in the art. The flash has bear in the art off 25. I mean, I think every one of these, hibernation doesn't, but it's hibernation. So it's like bear affiliated. Mm-hmm. Um, or Wisconsinite affiliated. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hibernation's a card, actually, I'm, a, I'm kind of a fan of. Um, in, in this case, though... <laughs> where you, where your deck is almost all green, I don't. I, I I'm a little bit unsure. Um, but I guess you know what? It's on flavor. He likes hibernation. Yep. It, Bears because hibernate it's a, because it's part of the deck. So I get it. Um, but it's also a card that is maybe going to be unplayable really really often in this deck. It's just going to screw you. Unless he's facing a recce history of Kamigawa. Sure, that would be great against a recce deck. <laughs> yeah, I would not want to see that happen. Uh, how about artifacts? Um, before we move on, I'm, I really find it interesting and it's probably because it's a super casual deck that the only counter spell in the deck is Trap Essence for yeah. Teamer. Yes. <laughs> because it's Teamer, I'm guessing. Yep. Um, but even no, no Rift. Yeah. No. No, that auto the, the We were just talking rift. about, about that. He's avoided the Rift Trap. So kudos on you, man. Yeah, for sure. Um, and Trap Essence is a fun card. It's a great card. In this deck, why not? So Make your bears it, bigger. Yeah. Um, so artifacts. I'm I'm not a fan of I'm majority of them. Super confused why there's an Atarka's monument. No soul but, ring also. But no signets. Or soul ring. Yeah, um, Atarka's monument. Um, um, because it's not even a, it's not in the, it's not bear in the art. I'm wondering if it's just because it's from the block, where Sirak Dragon Caller is from. 
Could be. So I'm guessing he's probably trying to stay super on theme. Um, so that is the only thing that makes sense for the most part here. Um, we've got uh, Hedron Archive, which is just a good draw spell, a good draw mana rock that you can crack to draw if you need to. Teamer Banner, again, I'm guessing is probably in here over something like Soul Ring because it's on theme. Looks like with, it's got a bear claw. It's got a bear claw on the shield, yeah. Vanquisher's Banner as well. Kind of looks like a bear claw, actually, in the flag. It's not. Yep. It's just jagged. And but He is running 16 bears. Yeah. So I mean, it's definitely worth the Vanquisher's Banner to get that draw. Yes, so, for sure. I agree. That's awesome. I mean, I agree with Chris. Like, a Tarkus Monument over, like, one or two of the Signets, it's probably because it's from the block, like Dana said. But, I mean, if you want to keep this casual but kind of make it a little more effective, I think I would drop the banner and the monument for, uh, you know, the gruel and um, Simic Signet since the green is your heavier color. I think you can leave out the Is It Signet for this for the time being, but that's that's my thought on it. Yeah. I, I don't think you need Sol Ring. I, I think Hedron Archive is great. It's versatile. You can, you know, tap for a couple mana or you can draw some cards off of it. So I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, sorceries, once again, a lot of bear-related action in here. Alpha Brawl has werewolves in it, but they're fighting each other. It feels like a shirtless bear fighter kind of card. Even Biomantic, Ma- Biomantic Mastery, which is a draw spell, but there's like creatures fighting on the art. Like, I think I, he's really going deep here with the shirtless bear fighter stuff. I appreciate it. No, I, yeah, of, I totally respect that. That's cool. totally reminds me of, like, those chair decks you see out yes. on the internet. Like or ladies looking left or whatever. Yep. Some of the weird ones you've seen out there, for sure. Epic Confrontation. Again, there's bear punching going on. Grizzly Fate just has grizzly in the name. And makes bears. Yeah. Savage Punch, obviously, is kind of the inspiration for everything, which is Surak punching the bear, which I'm assuming is the bearskin cloak. Probably that he's got on in the in the art later on. <laughs> Probably, yeah. yeah. So like that's pretty fantastic. Um, he did put a note. See the unwritten. It's just a good card. And same with Shamanic Rev. He's running them just to run them. But uh, Winter's Grasp again has bear in the bear in the art. So Love it. He's running that because of it. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's really tough to like criticize or come up with many suggestions here because of the way he's building it. Yes. It's also tough to go through because I was thinking about like, do I go through and try to find art? that has bears they might have missed, but I don't even know how you would do that. Scryfall doesn't let me do that. I tried. I, th- I think that was like a, at some point though, I saw that as a beta feature they were talking about is, Probably. is tags I for if, art. I bet if you're on their Patreon, you get that, fe- like you get the, the version, the next version early and stuff like and that. That could be on there. Yeah. yeah. So short of that, you just have to happen to be, see a card that has bear in the art and put it in the deck. But, um, Okay, let's talk about the creatures. Wait, enchantments. Enchantments, sorry. Enchantments. Because my favorite card in the entire deck is an enchantment. What is it? Words of the Words, words of, of Wilding. wilding. Uh, it is an enchantment for two and a green, one generic mana. The next time you would draw a card this turn, put a 2-2 two, two bear creature token into play. So basically you can not draw a card to spend a mana to put a 2-2 two, two bear out. Or, no, you still... Draw a card, you also make oh, the bear. Oh, you don't lose the card no, either. it's when you draw a card, pay a mana, make yeah. a bear. Oh, it's nice. like a reverse mentor the meek. So like, sure. draw a card, pay a mana, make a dude versus make a dude, pay a mana, draw a card. That's actually a pretty solid card there. It's a great card. And it has bear in the art. And the cool books and the guy summoning it. It's like a D&D art almost. <laughs> like. I well, think Arcane Adaptation is what the best enchantment in here. Shh. No. Yeah. But make yeah, them to make the right. non bears <laughs> make everything bears. Actually, the one I like a lot. I'm a fan of in general. I think Hibernation's End is a pretty cool card. Um, as Cumin of Upkeep, but it has whenever you, whenever you pay its Cumin of Upkeep, you may search your library for a creature card with converted mana cost equal to the number of age counters on Hibernation's End and put it into play. So like it costs five to play, and then it does nothing. But then in your next turn around, you spend one mana and put a one drop. Search library for a one drop and put it into play. Like yep. a two drop and a three drop. Um, I mean, it's not an amazing card or anything, and you're not really getting it for free because you have to spend one mana, two mana for the you know one mana two drop. But you get them out of your library, so it's kind of card advantage in that regard. Yeah. Um, I ran it once upon a time in a deck when I first started playing because I you know had one, and I haven't ran it since. It's a card I've always just liked though because I think it's a neat card, even if it maybe isn't good enough for most tune decks. Um, I think it's a really cool card in this deck. It, it fits, the name fits, the art fits, and it's useful. He's got a bunch of cheap bears he can grab. 
Agreed. So I'm a fan of that card. It's perfect in every way. I also like alpha status. Essentially, it's a... Uh, it gets The creature gets plus two, plus two for each other creature in play that shares a creature type with it. I mean, like we said earlier, he's running 16 bears. So you put it on that tiny little bear cub from uh, Portal not 2. So, not so tiny anymore. And that's uh, 18, 18? Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Oh, well, that's a solid 16, card. In, in, in this deck where he's playing it, it's for sure a solid. Noise. And Merganda Petroglyphs. Um, a friend of mine, our friend, oh, we, we've mentioned him on the show before, Frank used to run it in a tokens deck because so many of his tokens were, you know, vanillas. Um, Petroglyphs just gives creatures with no abilities plus two, plus two. So, so many of these bears are just generic bears, vanilla creatures that don't have any abilities, and they suddenly become, they go from being two twos to four fours. Now, again, you could probably run, you know, there, there is like Guy's Anthem, which just straight up gives all your creatures plus one, plus one, and it's going to be way more consistent, but it's a fun, it, it fits this deck. It's more fun to just play that For enchantment sure. and everyone goes, what's going what on? Are you, <laughs> what is Mercando what? Yeah, no, it definitely fits. That card exists? And it has fun art on it, too. It kind of was like a cave drawing. I'm not sure if there's, if there's is there a small bear there in the cave art. There might well be. I can't get a good enough look at it in the picture we have. It wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. What, what what card again? Merganda Petroglyphs. Yeah, I brought it up on Scryfall. I can't tell. It looks more like they're in like a cave with tree roots and some ancient uh, you know, artistic magic coming out of the wall. <laughs> This is why Max should not drink two beers yes. during recording. <laughs> All right. So uh, with the critters, it's a bunch of bears. I think he has two that aren't bears. Uh, Rattleclaw Mystic, which is a mana dork and can store mana for a future use. Um, does have a bear claw watermark on it, I noticed. Um, and Ixadron. Yes. Which yep. is, um, which, it's kind of a win con though, because it's like a kind of functional board wipe and it works with Arcane Adaptation. Yep. Yep. Um, and I think he has notes on both those two as well. But everything else, his other 28 creatures in the deck mm. are bears. Well, no. 16 of them technically oh, I guess are th- bears. Uh, the rest of them just have a bear like art. Or art or look like a bear. Yep. Like uh, Woodland Bellower should be a bear. Yes. I mean, it's a bear-moose hybrid, so that's some weird Canada BS <laughs> that I'm sure Ryan and Brando can explain for us in future dates. Wild Beastmaster is a, is a human shaman, but it's a beast master. Um, it could ride a bear. And, and there's bears in the art. It could ride a bear. There's, yeah, yeah, there's bears in the is, art. I just looked through all the arts on that, and all of them have a bear of some sort in them. Yeah. All right. Um, I love it. Yeah, I, like, like, there's so many better cards you can run, but then it wouldn't be this deck. Like, this deck is this, this deck. This is a Vorthos deck. This is totally Pure through deck. and through, and I love it. And, and decks you win, or games you win with this kind of deck, are so satisfying, too. It's easy to win a game with an Edric... By Master of Trust deck, you have to work for it and earn it with your bear with your bear art tribal shirtless bear fighter deck. I have a question, and I'm just gonna throw this out to you guys. If I were to like build this deck uh, that Raphael built and brought it to the shop, do you think I would be kicked out to, if I played it shirtless? I think you'd have to. I think you have to play it shirtless. Okay, I was really hoping that was gonna be the answer. <laughs> I also wear a kilt. Just. Just the kilt. Just the kilt. No socks, no <laughs> shoes. Just the sh- just the kilt and my hat, because I don't go anywhere without my hat. This image brought to you by Hotmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Raphael, for supporting us on Patreon, and thank you very much for sending us your super fantastic shirtless bear fighter deck. That thing is pretty sweet, and we appreciate it. All right. The next deck in the Deck Tech Extravaganza. Woo! It's brought to us by Bowen. You can find him on Tapped Out as Bowen No Win, B-O-W-I-N-N-O-W-I-N. It's um, almost a palindrome. It is It is almost. Um, so he's given us a Naya Control deck led by Zakama Primal Calamity. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Naya Control? Naya Control. Interesting. With a nine-drop commander um, based around mass land destruction. Whoa. And it's supposed to basically lock everyone out of the game while he then kills you with his giant commander or some of the giant angels he has in here. Okay, then. So, um, we, we kind of went over Raphael's deck a few minutes ago, and we didn't delve into the statistics of it or anything because it was a casual deck. Whereas this is a deck Bowen's trying to win with. Yeah, obviously. Uh, so, Mass land destruction. Yes. <laughs> 
So a couple of things I'm going to point out um, ahead of time here. The average CMC in this deck is 4.19. That's, that's pretty high for a deck that's supposed to be well, a tight control deck. The thing is, is that most of your mass land destruction spells are for CMC or higher. Right, right. I mean, it's, it's tough to avoid in that kind of deck. And your general's nine. Right, that also skews it a little bit as well. But Correct. we're in Naya, so you have all the ramp in the you world do. you would ever want. Um, except, well, we'll look at that in a second. Um, <laughs> the the other to thing is the mana curve on the deck is much more plateau like and i don't mean the land i mean it shoots straight up early flattens out and then <laughs> drops drops down boy does it ever and my sphinx deck looks very similar i think sometimes some decks there's just no way to whether it's because you're running you know all these five and six drop sphinxes or in this case you're running a bunch of six drop mass land destruction spells as well it's really tough to avoid in some decks i think that's the case here um it's a cheap deck but it's also not very friendly to it's it, it's pr- it's probably tough to play I think. Mid- Judging from the look of it, it looks like it would. If I was handed this deck, it would probably take me two or three games to figure out exactly how it needs to be played. Yeah. Do you say that without like, hey Chris, play my with the combo deck? Are you gonna look through it first, or you're just gonna shuffle it up and go? I'm just gonna shuffle it up and okay. go. Okay. Now, if you were to say, okay, give me five minutes, let me look it up, let me flip through all the cards quick before we shuffle up and go. Would that change your one to two game estimate, or would it stay? I still think it would stay about probably the second game. I'd be able to have more of a handle on it, due to the simple fact of some of these. Some of these cards are out there. Yeah, they and are. I agree like with that. Go through and see exactly what you're looking for, especially when you're. The big thing is mulligans on a deck like this. Um, so you have to really decide how what kind of hands you need sure. to keep, what hands you need to pitch. Well, and, and that's a good relevant point because the first thing let's look at here is the lands. 30 lands in a deck with a four, almost a 4.2 average CMC. And a, yep. and a three-color commander. And a three-color commander that costs nine. So th- this deck is untapped out, and, and we'll put a link to all these decks yep. um, in Twitter next week in, the, in our notes. Um, but... I, and tap out, you can do like a you can generate a hand and kind of play out the first couple turns if you want to, or as many turns as you want to, basically. So I generated a couple hands with this deck. Um, man, I had to mull and mull down very, very frequently to get a playable hand. With thirty lands, that's less than a third of your deck. You're playing three colors. There's a lot of double mana symbols here. It was really tricky to get a playable hand. Now let's. I'm going to shoot this question out there to him, and he can respond to it. And um, he will. Is this a partial Paris deck? Are well, they playing well, in partial Paris? Well, that raises the question. If you're playing in that environment, maybe it's much easier to do that. Yes. Um, because I think in, if, if you're not, if you're playing Vancouver, I think you're just going to get boned right out the gate a lot of games where you just don't get a chance to play because the the curve is so high, the um, average CMC is so high, and you're just going to draw one land in the, your, your first hand, then mulligan and draw two lands of the same color that don't do any good and then try to do it a third time and draw one land again. I think yep. you're just going to get hosed. You know, I, I've said this before on our on our show that I am not an, a master of the three-color decks like Chris is. Chris is our three-color master here. Um, and I've found this really difficult with my Gahiji deck, which is Naya, that finding that perfect hand be like, okay, I just, I yeah, I have four lands in my opening hand, but they're all the wrong colors. Yeah. What do you do at that point? Do you keep that four land hand because you have four lands, but you don't have a play probably till turn five or six? Or do you mulligan hoping you get that early game two or three play and hope you draw something to fuel you later game? Chris, do you have any recommendations for me and maybe Bowen? Um, judging by looking at it, well, especially with his deck, you need to go off of your colors. Mm-hmm. Like we'll take my Alesha deck, for instance. My main colors are black and white. Yep. Red is like a splash almost. Right. Um, so my land base is skewed hard. To, to not yep. include red. But I also have cards that allow me to find lands, or I tweaked it out with my mana rocks, which I'm looking through here and... 15 mana rocks. Yep. He has three fetch lands in here. Honestly, if I was running 30 lands, I'd probably run every single fetch land I possibly could in here. Yeah, three fetch lands Wait. and fully all three ABUR duels that are legal. Yep. In- including... Terramorphic Expanse and Evolving Wilds. In a control deck, it would not be bad. But I know a guy that writes an article that says you shouldn't <laughs> run those cards. I know you shouldn't, but... I five, I trolled Dana. <laughs> 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 I 
every week. Dude. Every week. <laughs> if, if you're running a control deck, I believe those are fine lands to play because you need your color and you need every option possible to do it to get those colors. And, right, the off-color fetches, if you're running that full suite of lands with a really tight land base, um, yeah, it makes sense there. I do think in a three-color deck, you just should have City of Brass and Mana Confluence as well. Right. Agreed. That I does, agree. That doesn't At help least your, one of the two. Yeah, that doesn't help you with like making sure you have two lands, that opening hand, or three lands, but it makes it much easier that you can yep. to hit the colors you need. To, to Chris's point of one of the two, I only run Mana Confluence in my Gahiji deck because I don't have a City of Brass, which is odd, but I had the Mana Confluence, but also on the off chance that like chromatic lantern comes down like mana confluence and doesn't is better hurt me. yeah yeah stuff like that so in in regards to running all the fetches you can including ex- expanse and evolving wilds would you cut more lands out for those or would you cut other cards in the deck i would cut other cards in so the you deck. would so you would up the land count and decrease the spell count essentially yes okay just i just was asking for curiosity there's one sake. card in here i would cut immediately and on. I, I have, need his clarification why it's uh, even in here. I bet we're thinking of the same card, and we'll get to that. So let's look at artifacts next. There are 24 of them. And 15 of them are mana rocks. Yep. However, they're not, none of them are the... There's a soul ring in here, um, but there's no crypt. There's no vault. There's uh, no mox diamond. Um, there's no lion's chrome mox. Eye. There's no lion's eye. Not that like we're no saying everyone petal. should run, though. No lotus petal. So once again, I'm I'm talking about that like... With those cards, you could maybe keep that one or two land hand much more comfortably because they give you that third or fourth at, mana depending on the rock. At that point, you're almost playing dredge. And you right, and you and you and right, and you it helps you get there faster. In this case, yeah, there's there's plenty of two drop rocks, and that's good. But uh, it, it, having two lands in, of that opening seven mathematically is going to be trickier to hit. I am looking at one artifact in here in general. Okay, called Oblivion Stone. That was not my card I was thinking I of. I do not know why it's being played in here. Seeing how this is the taboo deck, as he said. Yep. Uh, mass land destruction. You rely on your mana rocks hard. Yes. And Ozone's just going to blow them up. Yep. Uh, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Yeah, you could spend five turns putting fate counters on it, but that just seems kind of lackluster in my opinion. Yeah, it hits your own stuff. It's not particularly cheap to cast. Yes, if um, Avacyn's out stuff doesn't blow up but like that's true of any board wipe yeah uh, another card in the artifact section that i'm not a fan of now that we're talking about that is urza's blueprints oh i love I, that card well, though okay <laughs> in this deck though for six mana to draw one tap, card draw a single card with echo okay so next turn you sacrifice it no you just pay a six mana technically you can well no technically you wouldn't even have to pay the six you could draw a second card with the trigger on the stack okay so you can draw two for six if you're willing to sacrifice it if you want to draw two and not lose it it's 12 mana for those first two cards and then it's free after that but man if you were planning on something that you play sticking around for multiple turns drawing you cards and just run Frexian Arena yeah but we're not in black Oh, that's true. Sorry. I'm, uh, uh, I'll post, sorry. I'll post Siege. Yes, right. I'll post Siege um, you could do. I just, with no recursion, like I would get if he had some artifact recursion built in the deck, and maybe I'm missing it because I'm skimming through this extremely quickly, and I apologize for that, but like, if he had a way to bring it back every upkeep, draw the card, and then sack it to Echo mm-hmm. in some weird shenanigan way, I, I can understand that, but with the fact that your commander is nine and like Dana was saying, you want to get that guy out as fast as possible, be able to hit your MLG spells as fast as possible. Urza's blueprints could easily be cut for mana crypt, mana vault, well, any fast mana source at all. Or even harmonize. Part right. of the problem with Urza's blueprint is you don't get to play it unless you have the mana in play already. Right. Whereas harmonize is what a spell you can play to get you to the draw, that mm-hmm. gets you the lands, to get you to the next level. Um, now, there's probably games where he like opens with two lands, gets that third rock, gets gets a fourth rock going, or gets gets that two drop rock to get three mana, gets then another rock in play, and suddenly he can get this out and draw a few cards, and then get a few more rocks and get that like train rolling. Yeah. But there's gonna be just I feel like there's gonna be enough games where you don't because the the lack of of lands just throws everything that you're used to from the game's math to the wind. Yep. Uh, 
Another card I don't see in here that I just is an auto include in three colors is Chromatic Lantern. Yes, I get the purpose of this deck is to MLD yep. every chance you get, but it's still a mana rock for three mana. It solves so many problems. And it solves a lot of problems in case you're playing against a table full of control players, meaning blue, not Naya, that counter every single one of your MLD spells because they need their lands. Yeah. Um, so worst case, you get Chromatic Lantern out on turn two or turn three somehow, and then you're kind of setting yourself up because, oh, I haven't hit a white source for turns four, five, and six, but I'm okay. Right. Yeah, th- that, that is a, I think would be a really safe include here. Um, I, I agree. I would make Oblivion Stone into off to your command, or what's the new one? Cleansing something. Cleansing, Cleansing Nova. Nova. Because then you can tweak again. You can tweak it around your mana rocks if you want to. You can if you need to blow up that stuff. You can. Whereas Living Stone forces you to. Right. So I, that's what I would consider in that slot. And Living Stone isn't cheap either. It, it's at, at at three to cast and another four to activate. That's seven ma- or, or excuse me five to activate. That's eight mana to use it. I mean, yeah, off yeah. to your command six and Nova's five, but those are, and it's one turn, yeah. but grand scheme of things, you're still spending five just to tap the Oblivion Stone. Right. And as Chris was saying, if you need to save all your stuff with Oblivion Stone, now you're spending four every turn since there is no way to untap that Oblivion Stone right. constantly. Now you're spending four on your turn after you cast it. So there's seven for the next turn if it hasn't been destroyed for the next turn if it hasn't been destroyed so you're yeah you're essentially to keep your stuff that you need you're you're putting in 12 to 20 mana before you actually pay the 5 to crack o stone yes nope i i am with you there so i mean i don't have anything else to say on artifacts so no do you guys no should we move on to enchantments look at enchantments yeah there's some dirty stuff here there's a lot of dirty stuff here um yeah. fall the thran which just destroys lands Granted, I think we have all said this on this show, out of all the MLD spells, this is probably the most fair because mm. your opponents get lands back. Yes. They are going to they're going to recoup four if nobody destroys it and in my opinion if you're the opponent of this player, you're not going to unravel the aether or K grip it or anything like that because Oh, geez, it's turn eight, and you just killed my 20 lands because I'm the mono I, green player. I would if I was ahead on board. I would float you're my mana. Have all my mana right. floating after it resolved, get rid of it, and I'm ahead on board, and I'm just like, okay, I guess I'm going to win this game. I agree with that. Like, I can see it after maybe the first rotation. Like, cool, I got my two lands back at the end of your turn because you're the guy playing Fallen Thran. I'm going to deglamor it or K grip it because, cool, everybody, we're A, we're all at an even field, and I still have all my mana rocks. But yep. in general. Well, and one note I will quick make on just mass land destruction because we've all said this before, but we might as well repeat it here. Um, this is a deck that has a plan for mass land destruction. Yes. Which is why we've been talking about that and no one's made any comments about mass land destruction. We all tend to be perfectly fine if you're going to win the game. If that's what and this deck is trying to win the game. Yeah. It's not just being like, oh, yeah. you guys destroyed my commander, so I'm going to cast just, Armageddon. That's why I was super intrigued when he sent this yeah. deck. I was like, okay, I, no, I really want to yeah. see how this works. I would have works. no problem losing this yeah. deck because it has a plan with that mass land destruction. That's You're going to win the game, and that's perfectly cool. Um, Price of Glory is such a good card. Um, did you used to play this in Mogus? No, it's on my Mogus. To like sideboard to go in. <laughs> <laughs> but every time I look at, it, I'm like, oh, I really shouldn't play this. They it, hate this deck already. <laughs> it's that 110, yeah. 101 <laughs> to 110 spot. Um, two in a red. Whenever a player taps a land for mana during another player's turn, destroy their land. It's also the a pretty fair card. Like mm-hmm, right. play stuff on your own turn, and if you don't want to, if you want to counter my spells deal with it like yep. i i know i i have respect for that card you want a vampiric tutor at the end that's of my your that's a your choice yep. for sure in pain disaster is another good one during your upkeep if there are seven or more lands in play sacrifice it and destroy all lands so it's land destruction on a enchantment i it really sense here i really like ritual of the subdual it is four and two green for an enchantment with cumulative upkeep two and it says, if a land is tapped for mana, it produces colorless instead. Well, it's kind of a Blood Moon-ish effect. I think in it's green. worse than Blood Moon. Um, it can stick... Yeah. I mean, Blood Moon at least saves the red player. Right. This, this bones everybody. This bones everybody, except for that cosmic. It player. is six mana. Right. I am confused why he's not playing Blood Moon in here. That's another one of the things. If I am playing a control deck, and I'm going strictly off a of competitive play here, and it could be wrong if you're 
according to how you worded out your message you sent it us. It seems like they're everyone's They're, cool they're pretty cutthroat. Yeah. Um, I would definitely be playing Blood Moon. You jam Blood Moon, then blow up all the lands, and then from there on out, whenever they do eventually get a land into play, it's a mountain. Yes. And for you, it's, I mean, yeah, it's going to set you back too, but okay, you're playing red, so it's, you right. know, you actually have cards that you could play. Plus, with all your mana rocks, you're really not going to care. The sorceries are all a bunch of other mass land destruction spells. Or land to get her backers. Yes, or the opposite of that, to bring your lands back after you blow up the, the world. Um, and some of them are the weird targeted ones, like Boiling Seas, which is destroy all islands. Um, Tsunami does the same. Yep. So there's things like that that just hit, like Wildfire, I think, is... It, it Planes. Sac- each player sacks four lands, and it deals damage to each is creature it? as well. Yeah. I thought that was the one that destroyed uh, all Flash, planes. Flash Fires is Flash the one that destroyed, which is not planes. in the deck. Um, L- like from the loam to get his lands back after yep. the MMDs? Um, the one in here that I would not run, and this is all personal opinion, you know, I may be skewed on this, but I would not play Jocko Hops. And again, it is falling into the same category as Oblivion Stone. It Destroy- destroys everything, so it actually sets you back just as much as everybody else. And I, myself, and I think Chris does this a little bit, and so does Max, we like don't like to play cards that you can't play every time you have them in your hand. Yep. And this, I think, is one of the, for the most part, and this is one of those cards where there's going to be a lot of situations where you'll hit your board state and you're like, I can't play Jocko Hops right now because I've got more mana rocks than anybody else, and if I cast this, I'm not putting myself in a position to win. Yep. So I tend to agree with you there. Um, yep. I would probably just run another Armageddon kind of effect in that slot. I would probably just run Armageddon in just general because Armageddon, Armageddon right, is yeah. not in there. Yeah. Oh. Or just another recursion spell. To bring back one of the other mana. Seasons yep. Pass costs six mana, and you'll yeah. get at least one land back. Um, Wheel of Fortune is here as a sorcery, and I've heard that's a good card. So it is a good <laughs> card. I mean, I just bought well, one because I heard is. it was good. You got a really nice so, one in Vegas. This is, this is what I have to laugh about. This I'm actually have my mouse over Wheel of Fortune. Now Wheel of Fortune on paper is like a eighty or ninety dollar card or something like that. Even more now, it's, I think I, I don't know. In Vegas, I play. I paid eighty five for a uh, an MP one, and it is not MP. Com- when I showed it to every anybody, ADH, yeah, ADH rec guy, I, even the guy sold it to me. Goes, I think this is marked wrong, but here you go. <laughs> But on MTGO, it's selling for 3.21 ticks. That's $3.21. <laughs> <laughs> but nice. then again, it's the pain to play moto. That's right, where yeah, you that's really true. get, get I, just, I just find that amusing. I didn't mean to take away the, from the ticket price is low with the amount of blood you have to give up to play on moto. <laughs> right. <It's significantly laughs> Yet collected company is more expensive on moto than it is in paper. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the sorcery said that those Joko Hops is the one I was questioning as well. Um, recursion ones make sense. Life from the loam. Um, Wheel of Fortune, like we said, is just really good. Catastrophe is a cool card. Destroy all creatures or all lands. Creatures can't be regenerated, so it's nice that it flexes. Yep. Gives you the option both ways. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I would probably put um, Armageddon here and maybe Ravages of War if you could, because I don't think he's on a huge budget. Yeah, because you can pull <laughs> Obliterate like them three too. Duels. Yeah, it also cuts your curve down a little bit then yep. as well. I understand ob- with Obliterate being in here, it's because it can't be countered, so you avoid that. Yes. But still, it sets you back just as much I'm as everybody else. I'm assuming he plays enough blue players based on the Tsunami and the um, uh, Boeing CZ he has in here, so that, now, that makes sense with Obliterate. So speaking of Obliterate, I hate to segue off of this, but two weeks ago during Modern, there's a guy in, uh, that I play with. Um, we both play uh, Scred Red, different versions. Yep. I play more of a Agro Control version. He plays more of a Planeswalker Control version. Interesting. Um, he plays Obliterate in his sideboard. Of In Modern? Yes. Because it does not destroy Planeswalkers. Sure. And it can't be countered. So he's playing against a mirror control deck. He blows everything up, and he sits back with his Planeswalkers. And, and just, just, grinds, just grinds you to dust. And you're done. Yep. Did he actually... He, he actually oh, yes, he did. It, it was nice. hilarious to watch it happen. Wow. Obliterate in Modern. All Is right. Is it the same guy that showed up with the doubling season deck? No. Oh, that'd be cool. Shout out to John Popley. I love oh, you, man. okay. Yep. That makes sense. <laughs> Uh, all right, creatures. There is one in here. I don't two in here. I'm not sure why he's running. All right. Well, there's a, there's some mana dorks. So like you have things like Avacyn's Pilgrim or Birds of Paradise, which you know makes sense. You got things like Avacyn. Obviously, is built around if I get Avacyn out and then I cast that Armageddon or whatever it is. I guess Armageddon is in the deck, but whatever. Your stuff doesn't get hit yep. because she keeps your things your things protected. So that makes sense. What are the ones, Max? You were most um, unsure about. My first one. Protein Hulk. I, my, 
Um, my, all, my question is there is I just don't have an eyeball for combos or have like a list memorized. Is there some combo here that I don't see with Protein Hall? Because there might be. I just I don't have a great eyeball for that kind of thing. I mean, I, my only guess is he goes and gets Ramen Up Excavator and Azusa. Maybe. Um, because that would be your six CMC. Um, Ramen Up uh, lets you play lands from your graveyard, and if you do that after an MLD spell, you can p- now play three lands from your graveyard. Sure. So if you obliterate and everything blows up, the 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 act of the Protein Hulk dying lets you go grab excavator and then play those lands from your graveyard yep. it might Maybe. not even be a combo card it might, it might just be, might a be value because i do remember with his message to us he said that there's a lot of targeted removal in his meta so many people just don't want to remove Except it so yeah no if you jam protein hulk they kill it and he goes for anything else in his deck yeah and brings Maybe. it into play and everything else has a, amazing it, abilities when they come in. i mean aside from avison yeah it looks like and uh, i think it's bruno the fading light are the only two that he can't grab uh, yeah. Gisela. Well, he could just grab Gisela itself, I guess. Yeah. Oh yeah, the blade one. Yeah, yeah blade the red, gold the knight. red white one. But I mean, otherwise, everything else he can just go and grab and put in, and depending on circumstances. Yeah. This deck is probably very boomer bust, as in like either it's working and you're keeping people's lands locked out, or it's just not working. Yep. Because I was gonna say he's not running much in the way of defensive removal. There's no. Um, like Beast Within, or there's no source of plus shares kind of spells. But maybe that's because he doesn't care. Maybe he's like, yeah, I'm either going to win and take all lands, or I'm going to lose and I'm losing, and that's yeah. fine. Um, my second one is actually Azusa. Uh, in a mass land destruction deck, if you're playing three lands per turn just to kind of get ahead for that turn, and then you either kill all the lands or you kill everything, I don't understand the. I don't understand why you would want to maybe you resort go, a slot to that, maybe except you, for the Protein Hulk combo that well, I just pointed right. out. Right. It, it, aside, maybe that's enough. Maybe like being able to go grab protein or go grab um, excavator and Azusa off and obliterate is and a, then is, just is enough of a win. Play condition. three lands to turn out of your graveyard. Yeah. Okay. I but, get it. But beyond that, I agree with you because at thirty lands, the amount of times you're gonna have extra lands in hand to be able to play them with Azusa is gonna yeah. be minimal. And there is a crucible in the deck. We didn't mention that, but there yeah. is a crucible in yeah. the deck. So I, I mean, I think that is the game plan that he's aiming for. I, is I would assume obliterate so. protein Hulk dies. Go get Excavator and Azusa, play everything out of your graveyard. Yes. So that that, that completely makes sense there. Um, because otherwise, right, I just don't think she's doing much. Right. Because there's no extraneous card draw here really either. No. So, so once, you're, you're just not going to be putting lands in hand to play extra ones. But that's maybe enough in this deck. Yeah. That Kyle um, might be doing, doing enough. I'm also curious why you're not running more of uh, the control type creatures like Shalai or the other Sigarda. That gives you hex proof, or like your humans. I understand you don't have humans in here for the other Sigarda, but Shalai gives all your creatures and your planeswalkers hex proof. Yeah. Aside Every, from her, everything but her gets hex proof. Yep. Which helps keeps your your Avacyn alive for that that man, land destruction spell that is yep. going to keep your stuff safe. And it's another Protean Hulk target. Yeah. So, um, it's just, just little things like that I'm seeing. Yeah. The the creature base is the probably the most confusing thing for me out of this deck. The rest of it I completely understand. So, um, all right. Overall, I think this is a tight competitive deck. I just, I'm curious about the, about his, the mall rule he plays under. I feel like 30 is just too, too lean. Yeah. That, that uh, land base, I would say three color control. I'd almost want to run like 38 at least. I run 34 in Edric and that's a deck with like an average CMC of like 1.7 or something. And I'm still at 34 because you just need to have them in your opening hand. And yeah, you can you can mull, but like um, if you get too low, you're mulling on a four or five cards, and that right. also screws you in commander. Uh, I'm looking at it right now. I just sorted by CMC. Uh, he runs a total of 17 one and two drops combined. And there's a lot of creatures in there that make that easy. A lot of, a lot of those Lanwar Elf kind of guys, yep. which help you maybe get past that that one drop phase of the game. Um, like you said, Birds of Paradise, that kind of thing. Yep. Um, uh, Avacyn's Pilgrim, whatever. Um, but I, I don't, I just don't know if I, yeah, yeah it feels, it just feels kind of off. Maybe it isn't. Nope. I, I completely agree with you guys. I think it's a tad low on lands, no matter what. Yeah. So other than that, it's a very interesting deck. <laughs> I like the idea of Naya control via mass land destruction. Yep. That's very cool. And I'd like to see this deck played. Thank you, Bowen. Thank you, Bowen. 
All right, up next, uh, we got a deck from Chris Claus, who will make you jump, jump. Yeah. Um, it's like all I could think of when I kept seeing his name was uh, Chris Claus will make you jump, jump. You can find Chris on Tapped Out under the username Von Claus, C L A U S E. He's on Twitter at Chris Von Claus. Um, and the reason I'm going to give you that specific information is um, Chris does some pretty amazing um, custom card alterations. And there's none of them in this deck, but when he sent us um, his deck tech, he mentioned that. The, the Tanawa deck that Don Miner from EDH Rec runs that we played in GP Vegas, um, Chris actually is the person that did the alter on the Tanawa from that deck. Um, and then he also altered a half a dozen other like lands for, for Don as well. So we'll put pictures of those altars up on Twitter. The Tanawa one is super cool because it's a double-sided one, so you can flip it back when and forth phased. when it's phased out. And the lands really look good too. So Chris said he still does altars. Um, I don't think he's doing it like super actively actively but he said if you want to get a hold of him you are welcome to do so so we will put his information out there again along with the couple hard couple of cards he did because they look fantastic what a small world kind of deal that is too that the guy listening to our podcast was listening to us talk about a card that he did the altar on in that in that deck so that's that's awesome um chris thank you for sending us your deck to take a look at here yeah. thank you for thank su- you thank you for supporting us for sure yes absolutely um, so Chris sent us a Carador Ghost Chieftain deck called Carador Ghost Aristocrats. Um, he had a little blurb here he wanted us to um, bear in mind. He said his, his current play group is heavy on single target removal and light on mass removal. So he runs low to the ground curves. Um, he said he's steering clear of Karmic Guy, but if it serves more utility, he'll slot it in. And he said his pet, his pet card in the deck is a generous patron, which is basically a mull drifter the way he plays. Um, so basic numbers to mention here before we get into the deck, um, 2.46 average CMC. That is lean. That's super lean. What's Edric at? Edric is at 1.7. Getting there. I think, but I mean, that's obscure. Like, and n- that's two colors. So for a three color deck being at 2.46. Three color deck. And you're obviously in this deck, you're just not running one drops like I am. You're running actual real cards. So to, to get it, I mean, that's a, that's a low curve for a deck. Um, it's pretty heavy on bodies, um, but that makes sense because there's a lot of ETB stuff. Um, and it's a Carador deck with no Boon Weaver. No. I'm okay with that. I am okay with that too. So let's take a look at this deck. The, the one thing I will say before we get too deep into it is, man, this is really, really tight. It is super tight. It was really hard to... For like a non-combo deck, because like there's yeah. a Boon Weaver, you can you know see Carador Boon Weaver combo, and this isn't that deck. So you could turn it into that if you wanted, but he's just trying to run an aristocrats like low to the ground creature value town build. Um, that, man, there's just not a lot of breathing room to, t- to tweak this deck. Um, so let's talk about lands first. He's got 37 lands, um, which seems like it's more than 30 in the la- in the last one we talked about, um, and that seems like a, m- a more normal amount for this kind of deck, particularly yep. commander is also an eight drop, unless you have a lot of bodies in the yard. Um, he's got off-color fetches, as Chris mentioned. Mm-hmm. But he's got all three ABUR duels. He's got shocks. He's got the Amonkhet Cyclers and Battle Land. So he can fetch, basically, every one of those duels will fetch him a a duel that does both, that does two kinds of mana. And I think there was also a Murmuring Bosk in here, which does all three. And that's a four, so we can grab that as well. So that land base makes complete sense in this deck. Um, it's tight, too. Yeah, it's it's really tight. My only like hesitancy would be the fact that he's running six basics total. It, he's he's it's kind of a I wrote I have a note here that says it's kind of a greedy mana base and it's probably vulnerable to blood moon or ruination or whatever. Right. But if he doesn't see that in his meta, then, then, who why, cares? then why not be greedy? Right. right. If you never see those those cards, and, then go all in. And kudos to running bountiful promenade from battle bond i love all those lands we were told on twitter to stop telling people those are good cards dan krauss can <laughs> <laughs> um because they are great cards they are great actually i went i went home after we played tuesday night because because i looked at the shop because i wanted to buy one or buy a couple and they were they only had one in the shop i wound up buying two of every one yeah because I already had a couple, and I'm like, I'm just going to want play sets. And They're great. If they drop a couple bucks because they get reprinted, who cares? But if they don't get reprinted, 
they become ten or twelve or fifteen dollar cards. I feel yep. like. Or if we get the other half of them in Commander eighteen. Right. Sure. Yeah. That'd be great. I'd be okay with that. Hint, hint, wizards, which I'm sure isn't <laughs> happening because you already have already done. City of Brass and Mana Confluence, which we mentioned before for three color decks. Yep. He's got them both. Um, Gaia's Cradle like a boss. So, nice. and it's that, out of all the lands, that is the only land that confuses me. It is a forty creature deck. I don't think yes. it confuses me. But it only creates green mana, and yes. I understand. Like looking at his pie chart here, um, not a whole lot of green. I mean, it's pretty it, evenly split. It's fifty percent of his costs are green. The outer ring on the pie chart are your mana pips on your cards, on your spells. So okay. The oh, so inner a third is of his, your land yeah, producers. So a third of his deck is is green, but it but half his sources require green pips. So, so it makes so, sense. Yeah. And it's Guy's Cradle, and he's running 40 creatures, and it's still probably almost always going to be value. Right. Particularly because they're also low to the ground, that they're easy to get yep. out and play. I mean, he's going to very frequently, even if he drops Cradle on turn three as his third land. It's three mana. It might only be tapping for three or four mana at that turn, too. So this does play similar to Edric in that regard. Um, so that, I mean, is really solid. Um, yeah, there's just not much I would really change here that I can think of. Um, the one land I thought, because clearly this is not a budget issue, um, Ancient Tomb, maybe? I don't know what I would replace for it, but like, if, if you get that bad moment where there's something in your graveyard and the carrier's going to cost you eight, being able to get it out at six or you know, yep. get, get some artifacts out, I, th- I feel like... Because this is such an aggressive deck, he's clearly playing in a relatively uh, aggressive and competitive meta. Um, Ancient Tomb, you can afford to lose that life, and it's also such a strong card. And it's also such an expensive card at this point. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. Um, should be banned. Should be banned. <laughs> yeah, ban it. Um, sorceries. Anything there? Jumps out on anybody. A lot of tutors. A lot of tutors. That's an understatement. Yeah. Tutors and graveyard recursion. I mean... And sometimes both combined into one card, kind of, and like buried alive, where you're tutoring into your graveyard yep. to then recur it. Um, and things like Eldritch Evolution, which is great because it lets you cheat something into play, and the creature goes to your graveyard where you can then recast it with Carador. Or it fuels Carador to make him cheaper to cast. And I think he's, uh, Chris has put a lot of thought into this deck because he's currently running 16 one drops. Granted, not all of them are creatures. But then he's also running 17 two drops. Again, not all of them are creatures. Uh, so, And then he's also running 17 three drops. So that X plus two, he, I think he's kind of thought this out to where if I sacrifice a one drop, these are the cards I can go get. If I sacrifice a two drop, I can yes. go get this. If I sacrifice a three drop, I can go get this. So well, that's, that's particularly relevant when you, when you look at artifacts, which we can do briefly next, because amongst the artifacts hidden there, we're talking about chaining one drops and a two drops and a three drops is a birthing pod oh yeah yes there is now i didn't see again i mentioned this in the last one i'm not like an expert on combo i didn't see a clear birthing pod combo chain maybe there is one because there is enough pieces in there that kind of lend themselves to doing that but i just glancing at the deck I mean, there is a Safi Eric's daughter who's kind of a combo ho- horse and there's a Revel arc, but I didn't see a way to infinite off off a pod chain. I don't see infinite, but I see a way of killing at least one person outright. Um, between your guy's cradle, having Caridor on the field, you sack off, we'll say, any one of your one drops, uh, go for Walking Blista, play it for zero, or play it for infinite, shoot him off, replay it again with Caridor. Because Walking Blista is a zero drop, so you can sack off a one drop. Because it's X or less. Doesn't it come in? What does it come into play with? Zero counters. Yep. Dies. You replay it with Carador. Oh, yeah. You can yeah. play it out of the graveyard. Sure. Yep. For infinite, because you probably have crap ton of mana. Yep. If you have guys create a lot with 30 true. creatures or whatever. Yeah. That's one of the biggest things that I could see. That's. I was looking for a why I would run a guy as cradle. Yeah. yeah. No, that makes sense. I can see that. Sure. Um, there's a spore frog soft lock as well there a little bit with. with or, or unless you get those pieces as well. Like there's a yep. lot of. There's a lot of creatures here that do a thing, whether it's Viscera Seer, where you can probably get some loops going to like really dig down. Um, so let's you get some of those creatures like that as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like it. Um, anything else that jumps out at you amongst the artifacts quick? Because there's only a couple. Soul Ring, Mana Crypt, and Birthing Pod. No, nope, those all look great. Mana Crypt. Should be banned. We should have a talk. We did earlier. We did earlier, that's right. Enchantments, also only three of them. 
uh, Growing Rights, Rival of the Fittest, and Sylvan Library. And again, uh, it makes sense. Um, Growing Rights, I was actually a little surprised because it seems like a lot of really competitive players have been down on Growing Rights. I like it. For the meta we play, and it's a great card. I mean, worst comes to worst, um, it's a ancient strength pretty much. And also in this yeah. case, where he's where he's playing so many one drops, it's probably pretty easy to drop it a turn three and flip it pretty right. con- yep. really consistently. And it actually produces mana without creatures on the field. Yeah. So I, right. So if someone board wipes in an next turn or something, it's already been flipped. You've done your thing. You don't care. I'm sure there's a reason because, like Dana said, I also am not the guy who can spot a combo out of thin air. I'm surprised there isn't a food chain in this deck. Yeah. There's survival, but there's no food chain. But I'm sure there's a reason. I mean, not that survival isn't a just disgusting card. Right. Which it absolutely is. Um, and, and particularly in a Carador deck where, like, the thing you're discarding, you can just replay then. Exactly. So that is all really, really solid as well. Um, instant speed. There's more tutors there. I mean, for the most part, it's all tutors. It's it's, it's five tutors. Vamp, worldly, and tomb. Eldrami's call. Crop rotation to grab that guy's cradle and court of calling. So six tutors. Yeah. Boom. And then everything in the creature list. You know, it's stuff that interacts or cares about stuff being sacrificed or is mana dork. I mean, I I don't I, looking at this deck. I looked at. It, I was really struggling to come up with things I would suggest to add. Because for what he's trying to do, this is just a tight deck. He's just trying to I swarm. Have, there's yeah. one creature that I would consider, and he might have already considered it, um, would be Hangerback Walker. Oh, yeah. Similar to Walking Blista. Um, and obviously, you have already th- must have thought about it if it's not in here. Sure. But with the amount of sack outlets that he has in here for sacking out different creatures, uh, just get all those 1-1 one, one Thopters off of it. And yeah. then replay it from your and graveyard for yep. another 15, then sack it, and... Repeat the process. This deck really feels like having played against Don Miner a few times, quite a few times <laughs> in Vegas. In well. <laughs> this feels like a deck that Don would play, builds decks to play against. Yeah. It just is at that level. It's it's not CEDH, but it's playing at that level one notch below it. It's like multiplayer CEDH. Yeah. And they called that something too. Like they did, they did a show on Command Zone um, last week about the like different tiers of decks. Jank it's being like, like one and two all the way fo- up to CEDH. Focused was like the second to top. I yeah, believe. is that what it was? Because yeah. this is just at that one level below that perfect CEDH combo list. So now I'm looking harder. There's one other card that I'm curious about, What's and that, that is, um, I just completely forgot it in my mind. Now I saw it at uh, the five mana sorcery where you sacrifice all creatures on the field and return all creatures from the graveyard back to the play. Living death. Yes. Um, due to a few cards in here that you can sack off to make them bigger or whatever else, and then you just reverse it, swing with the guy, then the next main phase, reverse and bring all those creatures back and just keep the chain going for each turn. Sure. One thing I do remember somebody telling me once upon a time is <clears throat> in a, in one of those metas where people just run spells on a stick where like their deck is 35 creatures that all have an ETB ability. Yep. Living Death is really, really dangerous because you never know what's going to be in someone's graveyard. That's why you always look before you cast sure. it. <laughs> and he doesn't have he doesn't have any graveyard hate here, really. So I, I wonder if maybe that isn't a situation where he's like, oh no, everyone just runs all their ETB stuff, so if I yeah, cast Living Death, be. it's almost always going to bone me. That might be the case. Well, what I find interesting about this deck, and it's probably because it's just filled with one and two drops, is he's running one ramp spell. Well, yeah, right. Two, aside, technically. Aside from the Mana Dorks. Yeah, besides from the Mana Dorks, he's running Nature's Lore, which is the one ramp spell. Yep. Besides the two artifacts. And then there's a Life from the Loam. But besi- there's no Sky Shroud Claim. There's no Cultivate Kudama's Reach. Uh, anything like that, which I find it really interesting, but it makes sense with how small the creatures are when it yep. comes to casting cost. Yeah, in this deck, I, in this deck, I get it. Um. I like the deck, though. I like that it's not a Boom Weaver combo deck. It's just a really, really tight Carador list. So, Agreed. Anything else worth mentioning here? I'm looking really hard for the combo, and yeah, I can't I, find it. Yeah, I, was, I kind of did the same thing. Please um, let us know, Chris. Yes, or anyone listening that spots it before we do, because we'll get these lists out there as well along with... Yeah, I mean, I don't see combo, but I see a way that you can just go ham hard. I mean, that's what he cares about. Maybe he just cares about doing like some kind of a gross thing with you know one of the dusk rows or something where it is an infinite combo but it's going to put so much value out there by some yep. kind of a loop three or four times that you can't deal with it so 
All right. Thank you very much, um, Chris, for giving us that deck. And we will post some copies of your art out there on Twitter as well because that Tanawa looks sick. Yeah, it does. All Wish right. I could have seen it. It kicked my teeth in multiple times <laughs> and then phased away. Whew. Last but not least is local ish. Ish. Play, ish player Dan Mel, who. He's uh, within an hour and a half. He's just local hours, enough. Yeah. He comes to our shop on occasion. He plays FNM here. So he, he does. travels to play FNM in our shop. Just because of you two. Probably not. No. <laughs> um, you can find Dan on Tapped Out uh, under the name Melda, M E L L D A. And you can find him on Twitter at M3LL Drifter. So it looks like Mel Drifter, but with a three. Um, I'm not sure why it isn't just Mel Drifter with an actual E, because I can't believe there's anyone else named Mel Drifter on Twitter, but maybe. It's got to be fancy. It's like uh, creating yeah, sure. a character That's on true. World of Warcraft. You've got to be fancy you with your name. you use that leet speak, <laughs> well, you noob. Dan, who um, got beat up by Chris and Max before the uh, corset pre-release. <laughs> <laughs> High five. <laughs> 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 Woo! Was that, was that this episode we talked about? Or last, was week. last week. Last week. Okay. It's all begun to run together. It's the time travel again. <laughs> right. Yes. Um <laughs> So Dan has built a deck that I was not expecting to be the deck it is. Garn of the Blood Flames, number one, that's a commander from Dominaria that we have not seen and I've barely heard anyone mention. It's an uncommander. It's an un- yeah, it's well it's definitely an uncommon commander. And it's Warrior Tribal. And Garn is a warrior. Yes indeed. So he has built a a Garn of the Blood Flame Rakdos Warrior Tribal deck. And my only thing on the notes here is WTF. <laughs> <laughs> that's Mine. awesome, though. I love that. Like, that's super yeah, awesome. Because it's not Najila. Right, exactly. Um, so before we dig in, any final notes about that? We should, you know, let's read Garna, because I like everyone knows what Carador does. <laughs> but, but Garna, ooh, ooh. Max, what does Garna do? Garna is three black red for a legendary creature human warrior who has flash. Hmm, Interesting. Base power three, base power toughness. And then I guess this is why it has flash. When Garna the Blood Flame enters the battlefield, return to your hand all creature cards in your graveyard that were put there from anywhere this turn. Also, hidden at the very bottom. Other creatures you control have haste. This is the whole go to BS. (laughs) Put the good put the important part on bottom. (laughs) Wizards (laughs) likes to do that lately. They have been doing that lately. Okay. And let's awesome st- art. Let's start with land to be consistent. Oh, Why is there 40 of them? <laughs> 40, <laughs> Thank you. 40, <laughs> 30, is, 30 is not enough. 40 is <laughs> probably a few too many. Um, the curve's nice and clean. The commander has a relatively low, I mean, five mana is not nothing, but it's not six or eight or ten. Um, but the average CMC is under three. It's at 2.98. Um, so this is a deck that can definitely afford to chop down to 37 or 38 to be conservative, and I would bet you could run 36 pretty cleanly here. Probably. Yeah. And uh, in his notes, he specifically asks uh, what kind of card draw should be used. So, I mean, we have essentially four slots if we were to cut down to 36 to put all the essential black card draw. And I would probably As run, Dana would call it. I would, and I would probably slot, slot all into all those in. slots. <laughs> I would slot some more draw in there for sure. Probably be very tempted just to go like straight up the Read the Bones, Sign and Blood, Night's Whisper, and then maybe with that fourth slot, put in an Outpost Siege. Or Phyrexian, is, is Arena in here? I can't remember if I saw Arena. Arena is not. Arena's not in here. I would do two and two. I'd do Outpost Siege and Arena, and then the other two would be like Read the Bones and... Night's Whisper, Night's probably because like, that's easy to cast. Yep. Um, but yes, I, I would I would take a couple lands out and slot in some draw there for sure. There. Good job, Dan. We're done. We're out of here. All right. <laughs> see you guys next week. Um, no. So there's a couple more things that are that are minor here. Um, obviously, Cabal Coffers is great because he's already running Urborg and it's a two-color deck, but it's also like $35 now or something, so I get that. And I think he's on a bit of a budget. Um, is it really that much? Yeah. It's over 30 uh, gross. I think it's closer to 40 than 30 last time I checked, too. Cabal coffers. It's no different than strip mine spiking up to almost 20 bucks. The difference between strip mine and wasteland is nothing n- Nothing anymore. $32. $40 for the prop. <laughs> yes, indeed. I think I still have my damaged one. <laughs> um, so, what were we just. Oh, yeah, lands. <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
Well, so we we've been talking about adding Mana Confluence. This is a deck where maybe I wouldn't run Mana Confluence. I think there's enough options in a two color deck, particularly allied colors, that you probably don't need to lose the life. He's running Luxury Suite, so I have nothing else to say. That's great. <laughs> um, Smoldering Marsh also always comes into play tapped. Again, I think there's just enough options here for you to run lands that don't have any risk. I <clears throat> con- Congratulations, Dan. You are the first person in a very long time that I've seen that's running Path of Ancestry, and you're actually going to be able to use the scry for something other than your commander. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, your, 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 your land is ET being tapped, so you can scry maybe twice in mm-hmm. that case. I don't even run it in Sphinxes, and that's a because you know, it's only 18 Sphinxes. Right. So I, I felt like it wasn't worth it there. But I think in this deck, it probably is, for sure. Oh, for sure. So um, you, you could tweak the land base a little bit there. Um, I, I think it's a few too many, and that's that's kind of that. Um, um, I'm not a fan of the show lands, but I guess you need all the duels you and can he's get got, without he's, having right. them come into that. And he has a ton of basics. He's running 10 mountains and 12 swamps. Perfect. So he's that's almost always just going to be a come into play untapped land as well. So, that, again, that makes sense in this deck. Um, so let's look at the creatures here. Usually we've been doing that last, but it, it's a creature heavy deck. Um, he's running 33 bodies and I think every single one of them is a warrior. They are. Um, that, man, that makes sense. I don't know what to, I, I, I've got no, nothing to argue against there. They, a lot of them do a thing. Too. There's one just... that I will argue and it's because of the way that he has the deck built. Why would you run Zozu when you're running 40 lands? <laughs> Correct. Yeah, Cause that's going to burn you for sure. Um, I guess maybe his plan is he's not ramping, so he it's kind of a it's kind of early a, game strategy. It's a Mogus kind of deal where like they're going to take more damage than me, so I don't care if I take a couple because they're going to take more from all the other things that are going on in your Mogus deck. Yep, I would guess it's the same thing because you're going to take two damage from your land, but that dude who just played Sky Shard Claim is going to take the two and four more from his ramp and true. So that's what I'm going to guess, and it's a warrior. Um, yeah, I I, I was kind of. Not entirely positive on that one, too, but it's probably fine. <laughs> I mean, w- we could definitely go through all, of, what, 33 creatures? Yeah. But I'd... according to Scryfall, there are 343 warriors in red and black that are commander colors. legal. So, I mean, we could sit here all night filtering so this through. This one might be slightly better than that one. Right. I, th- I think the list, as it, just looking over it, I'm like, ah, yeah. I get every one of those creatures. I mean, it makes sense in this deck. Yep. I've I, played games with Dan. Chris has played games with Dan. I don't... Dana's played games with Dan. I have, yep. He is a good deck builder. Yes. Chris is staring at me. All your friends say you need to put a win con in your deck. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Caveat. We'll get to that, because um, I have a couple here. <laughs> but I mean, this is on theme. It looks great. All his creatures are the same creature type. That's yep. a step above a lot of other decks we've looked at. Sure, yeah. Or see just in our shop. Yeah, I, I do like the sub-theme of goblins that he has in here. Yes. yes. A lot of goblin warriors. Krenko then interacts with them nicely as well. Yep. Yeah, it works. Um, how about enchantments? Um, we, we already touched on this a little. No Phyrexian Arena, which is going to let you draw some cards. No Outpost Siege, which yep. is going to let you draw some cards through that impulse draw. Um, those would be my... Two big ones. I mean, Curse of Opalescence is fun. I mean, I've seen it in our shop, but yeah, I an don't easy th- removal spell. There goes all your extra mana you might make off of it. Right, and and, and I guess maybe there are situations where like uh, you're going to put it on somebody else, and then immediately swing with five warriors and get five yep. mana out of it. Um, but then everyone else is going to get to do that too. I, I think uh, knowing how creature heavy this deck is, Goblin War Drums. Would be a great inclusion to give, give menace. everything menace. Yeah, um, it works great in all my token decks. Um, I love menace. That's actually one of my favorite evergreen keywords now, uh, next to flying. I like raider spoils because it's one of those cards. I really that, like raiders that you can't run in most decks because because this is a warrior deck gives the warriors plus one plus O oh, and whenever they deal combat damage to a player, you may pay a life and draw a card. So that's a nice little draw effect yep. there baked in as well. That's a really cool one here that just isn't going to see much play in most decks. Um, he there's not a lot of lifelink type effects in this deck, so I mean an Erebos wouldn't be terrible. It's not on theme, but it's shutting your opponents off from gaining life to try to outrace you if you're swinging in with a bunch of little two twos and. But three I, twos. I, I would guess because he doesn't have any change links. I'm gonna guess he just really wants to be right. all and warriors. I completely and I get understand that for that. sure. The the two enchantments I would like to quick mention. 
Um, well, number one, I want to mention Shiv and Harvest, which he has, which is a sack out what um, spend two mana sack a creature, destroy a target non basic land. Here, especially where he gets to, he can do that in response to someone wiping the board and then flash in Garna yep. to get those creatures back. I like that. Punish somebody for, or at least maybe discourage them from doing anything to draw the attention. Um, so I like that. But two two things I would suggest. The first one is cheap. And that's shared animosity. It's under four dollars right now, and when your creatures attack, they get plus one plus zero for each creature that shares a type with them. Talking about wind conditions in a warrior's deck like this, that's kind of low to the ground and has a bunch of bodies. There are situations where, if he's got those creatures out and he's swinging at somebody without shared animosity in play, he just hits them and you move on into your day. Yep. If you have it and just drop it that turn, you just kill somebody. And then the next person's like, oh, God, I need to deal with that, or they're going to kill me. He's going to kill me next turn. Yep. So it's a it's an inexpensive card, and it's a win condition all in one, and I would strongly consider that. The other enchantment that's not so cheap, it's about 20 now, is Mana Echoes. Mm-hmm. Whenever a creature comes into play, you add a mana to your mana pool um, for, each other, for each creature that shares a type with that as well. So, like, you're getting a bunch of free mana. You play a warrior. You get a bunch of mana to play your next warrior. You only have to tap one land for it or something, which lets, that then lets you play a bunch more warriors. And he has a couple things here, like um, uh, what are the, the, the Cloudstone Curio, and we'll deal with these in artifacts later on. But Erratic Portal that let him bounce warriors and replay them, and that's even more so. He can generate, a, he can like get ahead on mana by playing warriors and then bouncing them and playing more warriors. Yeah. So I, I you can also get ahead on creatures if you have um, Mog War Marshal. Yeah. And he just, also just keeps spitting on a token every time. Yep. And another another thing he has going on too is Vanquisher's Banner. So he draws a card when those things come into when he when he casts those spells. So again, he can like get a bunch of Vanquisher Banner triggers he couldn't maybe otherwise do to draw a bunch more cards. I don't I don't see Vanquisher's Banner? Am I missing? Something? Or is that is that in my notes of things to add? It's in my it's in, it's in notes. my notes of things to add. So <laughs> we'll move on to artifacts. <laughs> so let's move on to artifacts because um, I have one as well. So the two I mentioned before, Cloudstone Curio and Erratic Portal. Erratic Portal lets you bounce a creature. You basically spend one and tap it, return a creature to its owner's hand unless that controller pays one. So you probably are using this on yourself in this case where he's going to like tap it, not pay the one, and then bounce a warrior and recast or it. Or bounce Garna back Or bounce Garna to, to recast a, Garna. Yep. Same thing with Erratic Portal where whenever a creature comes into play, or not Erratic Portal, excuse me, Cloud Stone Curio, whenever a non-artifact permanent comes into play under your control, you may return another permanent you control that shares a permanent type with it to its owner's hand. So he plays a warrior, he can bounce Garna, or plays a creature, basically, and he can bounce Garna. Um, so those are, are the ones I mentioned before. Vanquisher's Banner, I think Vanquisher's Banner is one he should run as well. It gives all his creatures of a chosen type plus one, plus one. He draws a card, and then it also when he has that synergy with he's, when he's bouncing stuff and replaying it, he can draw extra cards out that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I've noticed this just looking through some of the artifacts. I like the sub theme of the looting effect of draw because he's putting more stuff into his graveyard and then playing Garna to play Garna to bring it back to his hand. So I don't need this right now, but I might need it, you know, later type of thing. Um, one artifact I would suggest, and I only suggest this because I've seen how good it is in Dana's Sphinx's deck, is uh, Chromatic Lantern. You're in two colors that don't ramp very well. Granted, you are running a very nice land base with 12 and 10 mountains and then all the other duels, but having Chromatic Lantern, in case you are shy on one of the two colors, it's going to fix you, and no one's really going to remove it in a two-color deck. For sure. You know, in a three-color deck, it might get removed a lot quicker because, oh, you don't have any white in your Naya deck. Let's get rid of that Chromatic Lantern. The main reason I run it in Sphinxes is because so many Sphinxes are two or three blue. Right. And then I, I need to have I want I want to be able to save some counterspell mana too, and that gets tricky. I don't, but I I haven't played this deck at all, so I don't know how his mana works out that way. But it's kind of a similar thing. He wants to have mana free to flash Garna in at some random time, so maybe that lantern helps him make sure he always has it. I also like Smuggler's Copter in this deck. I do Granted, too. it is not a warrior, but Warriors can drive. <laughs> I like that, yeah. Any other artifacts that jumped out? Actually, here's one I'll a quick mention. Um, Falcon Ori. No, it's not cheap. And no, I'm not rocking the uh, Josh Lee Quai giant 
<laughs> Anac- Anaconda <laughs> arms when I say you, that. You do remind me of DJ, though. Well, thank you. I, we're, <laughs> we're much more similar in our build. Um, but in this particular deck, um, Dalkin Ori, I think because your commander has flash, and it lets you then also flash your other stuff in. Because you're maybe going to be holding up mana at times to be able to flash in your commander. Well, then maybe you decide you don't want to flash your commander in. I'm going to flash in some other stuff. So I think in this deck, especially where you're going to be doing things with your commander at instant speed, I think it really makes sense to do everything at instant speed. Oh, what do you guys think about like a Drazi Monument or something? Something that gives a little bit a more finisher. of a, yeah. a win condition. Yep. I, I like that idea. I mean, we talked earlier about being at 40 lands. We originally said cut some to put those draw spells in, but I mean, a five mana make all your two threes plus one plus one and flying and indestructible. Also, kind of win condition in this deck. A little yep. bit, a little oh, bit. great! You have to sacrifice something and then you flashing garner to get it back. Okay, and then that's bounce fine. her with erratic portal and right. sack it again and the next again. turn. And yeah. yeah, that that would give him another win option as well. I agree. I agree with that for sure. Um, it's five. It is five, but um. You know, sort of feast and famine costs three and two to equip. Not yep. that I would pull that out necessarily either, but yeah. My only other recommendation, and this actually has to do with lands and sorceries, which I guess can we move on to? Are we done sure. with artifacts? Yeah. Sorry. Um, so speaking of sorceries, I don't see any blasphemous act in this deck. Yeah. Um, so my thought process, granted, I get this is an aggro based deck. It's not going to cost you more than one. Right, it, it's always going to be a one mana, which which is nice though because then it lets you have mana free to flash back in Garna. Garna, which then leads me to say, you should be playing Reliquary Tower, so when you flash in Garna and you bring back six to ten warriors that have been on the field, you don't have to discard them on your turn. Right, they're just in your hand until you want to flash them in with Elkinori or play them next turn. Yeah, that's uh, my only suggestion for I a sorcery. I am on board with that fully. Um. Yeah, that's 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 it. Um, I don't love kindred dominance as a sorcery, um, but I don't not love it either. But I think I would probably run blasphemous act there. I know it doesn't touch his warriors, and I'm guessing that's why it's there. Um, I would rather play um, Ingrid's Wake, same CMC. Two men, two mana more, and you hit everything. And the planeswalkers on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ingrid's Wake. Yeah, like Chris said, it's gonna hit. Not just a creature type; it's going to hit everything in Planeswalkers, but not yours. I, yep. I would go. I would go one of two ways: run in Garuk's Wake, so you can um, make sure you clear the board of anything that's scary, or spend less of Blasphemous Act out. Basically, one do the same thing. Um, I would go one of those two directions. I feel like Kindred Dominance is kind of in the middle, in, which where is not a place you want to be. Like at seven mana, I would rather draw a gazillion cards off of Decree of Pain. I guess that's eight, but like agreed. I'm going to do that than I would have maybe my creatures, my, my three or four yeah. creatures get saved. I, yeah, I think Decree of Pain would be my number two pick over, like, Blasphemous Act, Decree of Pain, and Groot's yeah. Wake. Those would be my Blasphemous top three Act choices. just works so well with Garna's ability. Yeah. What, giving you so much mana free to still cast her that I, I agree there. Um, there's a Cough of the Hammer here, but that's just uh, currently in uh, as a placeholder for Goblin, Goblin Trash, Trash Master. Master, which is a good card in this deck as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and Rakdos Charm um, is the only incident in the deck. Um, Rakdos Charm, I don't know if I have any Rakdos decks right now, or decks that have black red. Rakdos Charm, I think, is probably underplayed. Um, exiling all cards from a player's graveyard is never not useful. Destroying an artifact is never not useful. Um, and each creature deals one damage to its controller. You just kill people in some games with that. You do. A lot of games with that, you just kill the, somebody. The only caveat I have to say about that final mode is if you cast this at the wrong time with this deck, because it's everybody gets hit by it's that everybody. mode. everybody, right. So if you have eight to ten creatures out and you're at 12 life, you're knocking yourself down to two. Sure. But but the other two modes are going to be always rel- so yes. relevant. There's always an artifact to hit. There's almost always a graveyard to hit. It's not like it's ever going to be a dead card if you don't use that third mode. And at two mana, if it if it didn't have the third mode, if it just said destroy, it just let you destroy a graveyard or destroy an artifact, man, that still might be a pretty decent card. Let alone that third option on there for two mana. Right. Um, so I'm I'm guilty of this as well. Like when I build a deck that has black red, I can't think of the last time I've put. Arakdos Charm in the list 
even just experimenting. And I really should. It's such a good card. So, so props to you, Dan, for, uh, for running that as well. Um, I feel like there maybe should be a few more instants in here just because he's going to want to do things at instant speed with Garna, but, I, I, but nothing is jumping out at me. So I guess in Tomb, but that's expensive. Because in Tomb, you could throw something into your graveyard and have it come back with a, with a Flash Garna at instant speed. True. Um, and it's one mana, so it sneaks in, but I, I don't know if that's worth... None of the creatures are particularly like game-ending for you to put in your graveyard in the first place. So I don't know if that's probably worth doing. Yeah, I think pretty much the only thing that I see that this deck is lacking is the card draw to keep the constant pressure going. Yeah. And that's if you easy can to keep fix the constant pressure going, you should be able to overwhelm quite a few players in a game. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I'm, I want him to bring this to the shop and play it, so I want to see this deck. Or maybe at GP Minneapolis in a few weeks. There we go. For sure. All right. Man, that was an extravaganza of deck techs. We Whoa. have torn through them. So... Um, we will probably be punching out for the night, I think. Thank you very much to all our, uh, the, the four supporters we did shows, of, we did decks for tonight. We appreciate everything you do for us. And all of you out there listening, we appreciate you too. I'm Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Chris. Chris.